tell me about December of 1961 with the movement. I know the students, we stopped with the students um, protesting the arrest of those students that tried to integrate the Trailways bus station. But what happens in the month of December of that year? Well, in, in December of 1961, uh, the Albany Movement called for a boycott of stores downtown. And they called um, for a black Christmas, actually where you would not put up decorations, that you were in mourning for uh, the things that were happening in Albany and the fact that Albany was totally desegregated and that the city fathers were being obstinate. So um, for the most part the boycott was successful. Uh, people would shop in Moultrie, Georgia or other cities where um, they had stores that could handle what they needed. And uh, so, also in December, a group that were called the Freedom Riders decided to come to Albany by train to test the facilities at the train station. And um, they, I, I'm not sure of the date, it may have been around. Mm, December the 10th or something like that and uh, that group um, well that, there were several people in the group from SNCC and there was uh, one college student I think Joan Browning was was a college student but not necessarily a member of SNCC as, but she, I don't think she was a member of SNCC she may have been and I think um, there was someone on the train from SCLC and Tom Hayden of Students for Democratic Society and his wife Casey who was to observe and uh, there were, were uh, Lenore Tate and some others that uh, I can't I can't think of all of their names now but I have it on paper somewhere and so they came down by train and they got to Albany and they went into the white waiting room but they weren't arrested and they came all the police officers were, were present and there was a large crowd because everybody knew that they were coming Bertha Goble was in the crowd um, a Willie Mae Jones who was down just to pick up some of her relatives she was not a part of the movement anyway when the group went outside uh, they were met with cheers by uh, a group who were there, you know, to see them, you know, and their applause. And so that's when the police decided that that was creating a disturbance. So they arrested the, the Freedom Riders and then they pulled people at random from the group waiting, including uh, Bertha Gober and Willie Mae Jones, who was not a part of the movement at that time. She later became a part but she was just there to pick up relatives. So they took them to jail. This was on a Sunday, I believe. And um, the next planned march, the Albany Movement, of course, met the, next, the following Monday. And um, a, um, a march was planned on the day that they were going to have the trials for them and um, I'm trying to think I believe that was trial was going to be on Monday also but and the, the reason I believe that is that um, we went over again to Albany State <laughs> trying to get people to march and uh, once again, we didn't know what would happen, and of course nothing happened, they did not march. We, we went back over there to meet them, where I think we said we would meet under the flagpole or somewhere, but nobody was there. And Janie Rambo and I went, and Bernice was taking a test, and uh, so Janie and I called a taxi to SNCC's office, because we didn't want to 
the march to start without us and uh that's where we the our part of the march started on Jackson Street. Snick's office was on Jackson then next to Price's barbershop. And we got there and the line was very long and so um we started off and that's when it started to rain and I don't know Slim's name, but he Slim was the mentally challenged person who wanted to get in line and the ladies told him he couldn't go. But I thought he should have been able to go. Anyway, we started off and that was that that's what led to the first arrest. We were on the way to the trial of uh the Freedom Riders. And we sang and circled the block and um two or three times before we were arrested. And that's when we went into what later became Freedom Alley and waited to be booked in the rain, waited in the rain. And um, Yeah, I've seen images of the police when they decide to arrest those that are demonstrating. Did they actually, on this particular occasion, walk on each side of the group and head the group down into what you said became known as Freedom Island? Well, I was one of the first, I was the, with the first group arrested. When we, when I came around the corner of Jackson and Pine, uh, the, the two times that we circled the block, there was, it was no policeman was there. The third time I came around, Chief Pritchett himself was there with his billy club. He wasn't hitting at anybody, but he was standing there in his yellow outfit, and he said, you're under arrest. And then another officer came up so that Chief Pritchett was on this side of the alley, like I'm facing you now, and uh, the uh, other officer was on the other side. And... Uh, the people who were not yet around the corner did not know that you know we were stopping that we had been stopped so when they came the group coming from coming around the corner you know when they came around abruptly there we were so it was like a pile up and then uh the chief Pritchard and the other officers just got on the side of us you know and said you are under arrest you know and they were just hurt well you don't like that word but they were just pushing us into the alley but it wasn't violent mm -hmm. but so people went to the end of the alley mm -hmm. and they were still pushing people in so that's why I said that word because as they pushed more people in we were jammed together and I was on the left side but there were people all over here that were garbage cans lined up over there and uh, then there were the steps and some people were on the steps. Those were the first ones to to go and be arrested were on the steps. And so when I saw that, I cut line because I was thinking, well, they can't get all of these people in jail and I want to go, you know, I want to make my statement. And uh, I mentioned the garbage cans because when we were finally, and I may forget this, to say this later, when we were finally let out the next week, they had taken our belongings. And they had taken the, uh, I, my, I had an I Believe in Dignity button. And, I, you know, I wore it the night of the poetry reading at Albany State. And I forgot to tell why I wore it. But anyway, they had thrown those away. They had to go get them. And they went all out in those trash cans. And they were still in there. And they gave us back our buttons. So that was in, in uh, December the 12th or something like that. I can't and so we were arrested and uh, I don't know how long, they say hours and hours for all the people, but I was already inside so I don't know. So, so once you were arrested, is that when, you know, folks spent the night in the Albany City Jail and then were transferred over to the National Guard Armory and then sent away? No, uh, we were we were arrested and there was no booking and fingerprinting and any of that. But we were just taken by the jailer into these cells and crammed in. It was I was in a cell for four with 23 other women. And we stayed there until maybe dusk dark. And then they took some out and took them to the county jail. 
I didn't hear any mention of anybody going anywhere else. They just came back and said uh, something like, all right, and called the name, going to the county jail. And so they left, and Janie and Ann Bullier were one of them, so that meant, you know, my little nuclear group was split up. And it was only the next morning when they came in and, and called our names, 40 of us, and said we were going to Baker County. And we didn't have time to tell anybody. So they put us on buses, and we saw people in the streets, and we were yelling out of the bus window trying to tell them to call Attorney King and tell them that they had taken 40 women to Newton. But the people, obviously they couldn't hear us because they were just waving and smiling. And I said, oh no. And um, the president, let's see, um, Marion King, Slater's wife, was, was among that group. Dr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson's wife and I were in the same cell, but they took her, either they took her to the county jail or she was bailed out, I can't remember. But um, Marion King went with us and two of my classmates, you know, I mean, who, that were in the same class. I knew all of, most of all of the other people. My hairdresser. <laughs> and so we went to Newton. Okay, and how long did you end up in Newton? And what were the conditions of the jail while you were there? Well, uh, they took, when we got to Newton, uh, they drove us to what they call the old jail. I never saw the new jail, but the old jail was close to City Hall because that's where I, the, the police officer from Albany who went with us stayed in City Hall. And when we got there, there were about a hundred men outside the, the cell chanting, Freedom Riders, Freedom Riders. And I was thinking, I've never been on a freedom ride. And then they saw my friend, Annie Ruth Williams, and they said, look at that big one. I bet she bad. I mean, they were saying all kinds of stuff like that. And so I kept looking at them, and that's when I saw my cousin, Paul Phipps. And I kept trying to get in a position for him to see me. But I never could, and I didn't want to call out to him. So uh, they took us in this cell block. We weren't ever put in cells. There were cells there and they had mattresses, which, you know, Albany didn't have mattresses. And we could smell uh, Lysol or some type of cleanser where they had cleaned up. And there was a water fountain where you could get water without putting your mouth over the, uh, you know, the receptacle. And um, it, was, it was much better than the jail in Albany. So the policeman from Albany said he wanted to get us settled. So getting us settled was really just putting us in the jail and then he told us where he would be. And um, then the, when they fed us, uh, the, the door was flung open with a flourish and one of Newton's finest kicked in a box. And uh, he said, that is, you can eat it if you want to. If you don't, you need not to. And he left. So we went and looked in the box, and it had individual plates of food. Um, and the food, well, you know, the food was always, um, how can I say, peas, and and they put raw onions in there. It's like they <laughs> wanted to make it as uncomfortable in there as possible. And cornbread, and it was very hard, like this. And then the, the meat that the peas was cooked in, the, 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 it, it was sow belly, and it still had the nipples on it, you know. And I said, well, where, where did they find this? I've never seen this in a grocery store. Do they just fix this especially for prisoners, you know? So we wouldn't eat it and marry it. And then that's when they sent in, a, a, about an hour later, these men, white men, about ten white men came in. The police from Newton let them in. And... Um, he, 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 this is what he said, that he, they wanted to look us over. And so what, we, we had started to bathe. What we did, we had taken off, um, you know, undergarments and washed them. And then we were trying to wash ourselves with the undergarments. So some of the, some of the girls were in their slips. And the men walked around looking at us. And then they didn't want to leave. The officer had to make them leave. So after they left, Marion King called us over in a group and she said, you know, 
she said, um, tonight we may, said, we may have to be violent. She said, we may have to fight. And so we were, we, none of us ate uh, the food and the, the dinner. And then we went back to those boxes and got that cornbread. That was a, a weapon. We were armed with cornbread. And I'm telling you, it was this hard. But they didn't come back. I took first watch. And I was standing at the window watching, and all night cars drove slowly by, but nobody came back. And we could hear other buses. I don't know if they were taking people to Camilla or what, but we could hear heavy, you know, traffic. And so that was how we spent that first night. And then breakfast, with the same flourish, it was kicked in, and it was grits and grease. And it's like they let the grease get cold, so it was congealed on the, the grits. And um, I think it was some more of that sow belly. And, you know, we didn't eat that either. And uh, so that's how jail went. And we... Um, when did you finally get out? Well, they had a... Um, see, things were going on that we didn't know about in jail. And, and that was when they... Um, see, Martin Luther, when Martin Luther King came to Auburn, I was in jail. So I didn't know about his march and that they had met with the city fathers and had come to an agreement and a call and all. I didn't know that. But what they did was say that we would all be released. Uh, I think it was on bond or whatever. And and then the, the all of the mass demonstrations would stop. And that they would eventually meet with uh, people from the Albany movement. And of course, they didn't. But that that following Monday it was a week. Yeah, the following Monday, everybody was released. And so, if you were out of town, somebody, the police officer from Albany came and got you and drove you back to Albany down to the um, jail. And everybody and it was, was so funny because. They came right by my house taking me to jail, you know, <laughs> but he could, you know, I, I said he could have stopped and let me out, but so I had to go all the way to jail and then call my father and he came and got me and he got, I think he got Marion too. Okay, that's what I was getting ready to ask you. And uh, I think he took her home because he had a truck and then I saw Janie that evening because she was walking, she didn't have a ride, you know, and I was sitting on the porch. Because I had, you know, I was, I like to be in the air. And we just, we didn't say anything, we just threw up our hands. And then they had a, um, I'm trying to think if, they probably had a mass meeting that evening, but I don't know. But I didn't, I didn't go. Actually, I was sick. I, when I got out of jail, I was, I was sick. Because I had, I had eaten very little. And I was already anemic. I was. I had to go to the doctor every Thursday for shots, mm -hmm. and I had missed the shot that week. And uh, so, how long were you in jail? A week. Wow. Well, well, wait a minute. Let's see. Um, six days instead of a week. But Bernie said she was in jail for two weeks in Leesburg, but I didn't. I didn't know that. I thought everybody got out after they. They. Um, you know. Everybody got at the same time. That's how it, they said it would be when they went down to that meeting. So then that's when I heard that Dr. King had marched and that they had had this meeting. I was thinking, oh, wow. Well. So, and then in January, um, Ola Mae Quarterman got on the bus and... Um, According to what she said, you know, the driver would always, they would never wait for you to sit down. And they seemed to take delight if you were black and starting up so you would fall or stumble. And that's what happened to her. And she stuck, fell, stumbled into that seat and then she didn't get up. She just remained there. And then he told her to get up. And uh, she told him she paid her damn 20 cents she said where she wants to so he called the police for her using vulgar language at him or something so she said it wasn't at him she said damn 20 cents she didn't say it but you know they arrested her and so after that was heard then that's when uh the bus boycott 
was went into effect, and it it worked very well because the, it put the buses out of business. I mean that wasn't the intent. The intent was to to, to get them to desegregate, but because you would have to um, sit on the back, and if the bus filled up, you'd have to stand up. And uh, so we wanted the buses to desegregate, but they didn't, so it went out of business. Okay, here's, here's my next question. After the success of the bus boycott, what's the next move from the Albany movement? Well, see, what happened, um, this was in 62. Uh, students came from everywhere. There was a group in um, New York called Friends of SNCC. And they were sending uh, clothes and stuff down for people in Albany and to go to Mississippi. It was like whoever was going south stopped in Albany for training. We would go to Cornelia Farm and uh, have workshops on nonviolence and whatever. But students came from Brandeis, from, from everywhere, all of the Ivy League schools and some of the smaller schools, Earlham, Franconia, schools I'd never heard of. And uh, bus bus loads of people would come from Chicago. One one night we went to a mass meeting, and that was his father, somebody, and a whole group of students from a Catholic church or somewhere. And they would they would just come, and maybe they would stay a day or two, and um, and, you know, and then the national media with with Dr. King's coming. Uh, we had John Chancellor down there, and this other man I can't think of, Herb Kaplow or something like that. And so they were there, um, and I can't remember if this was the time when 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 um, Attorney King was clubbed in the head by Cub Campbell. But I know national media had been there then, so they would. They would come, and, and then everything changed with Dr. King's coming. It sort of shifted from people not just doing things spontaneously. They were waiting for him, you know, for what he would say or for what he would do, except the, the SNCC people. See, we, we got in trouble because we, we acted like students. Okay, it, okay. before all of the students came in January, we went to SCLC Citizenship School training. Did, were you in Dorchester? Yes. Okay. And, um, yeah, Evelyn, Tony, Bernice, and I, Blanton, and that's where we met Hosea Williams. He was based in, in Savannah then. He had never be, gotten his prominence. And Guy Carawan from Highlander School, and you know different people from different places where stuff was going on the Carolinas, and so we stayed there, and because we didn't do certain things, um, some of the people said we performed, that we showed out in Dorchester. This is what happened. They had tables put together in a V, and Dr. King was at the V, and so. They turned the chair sideways so that everybody would be facing him. Well, how, that meant you would have to eat this way, sideways. So the group from Auburn had turned their chairs around the way you would turn them at a, at a table. And so they, that's what they said we showed out. And then um, Dr. King was, you know, he, he didn't do a lot of talking. Abernathy did the talking. And, of course, Abernathy said, uh, something about Dr. King, and he, he said, the man that you want to get down and kiss the hem of his garment, something like that. And so Bernie took offense to that, you know, because that sounded like Christ, you know. But Dr. King didn't say that. Abernathy said that. And then, so Bernie was frowning, and then they wanted her to sing a song and put SCLC in it. So she did it, but she put SNCC in it too. And then Dr. Abernathy wanted me to drink from his cup, and I refused. So they said we. I told him, you know, and he and he said you don't want to drink from my cup. And maybe I shouldn't have said it. I said, well, my. I said my mother taught me not to drink behind other people. And I. So they said we performed. Anyway, we came back and we opened up the citizenship schools. And then that summer, all these students came, 
and they canvassed in different counties. So I don't I only met the ones who worked in Albany, like Martha Prescott, but she was on her way to Mississippi. I just met her briefly. But we became lifelong friends. And I met Susan Herder. She was the granddaughter of the Secretary of State, uh, Christian Herder. Um, so they just sort of fanned out in southwest Georgia and in Albany. So everything was sort of intensified. And that's when all of those little sit-ins and little things, little agitations went on. And I think that was the year the pool jump. But now the summer of 63, I get confused sometimes because I wasn't, you know, I was just intent on the activities. And I wasn't, you know, I just never thought about remembering when this thing happened or when that Because you happen. guys never thought of yourselves as historical figures. No, no, no. no. <laughs> people never do. <laughs> that one day people would look back and say, you're a historical figure because you did this, this, and this, and it changed the direction of this city and how things went in this region yeah, and we on and on. We didn't think about that. And see, this was the summer of intense voter registration. And this is where... I met Blue. See, I had canvassed in Albany. I had a very large area. I canvassed in, I, I, I canvassed so much I was walking with my head down. I looked up, I had come to President Dennis's wife's house. Because, you know, they had a house out in Coachman Park. And, and, and she was out on the lawn, but she didn't see me. I just turned around and went back. Was this in 62? Um, or 63? See, there you have me. I, I have to really try to figure out when it was. But this is what, so everybody was canvassing, and I walked into Snick's office, they had moved on to Madison Street then, and then Sherrod said this, and I will never forget this, he said, um, this is uh, James Daniel, and he said, he's a gang member in CME, he said, and uh, we'll see. Let me go back from that. Felicia Oldfather and I, she's, she was a white student from somewhere. We had been canvassing in CME, and the police followed us, and we were thinking we were going to be arrested. Because, see, we had already been arrested. Felicia and I were arrested one, the street, on the street behind where I live for passing out leaflets, you know, telling people to come to the mass meeting. So then after we, we uh, they took us down, but they couldn't hold us. Because by then the FBI was in Albany, they couldn't do trumped up stuff, so they had to let us go. So then we went canvassing in CME, and the police followed us, and we didn't know, we thought maybe they would arrest us again. So we went in the lady's house and asked for some water, but she knew what was happening, and she let us stay there until they left. So then we told Sherrod, and so the next day, I went to go canvassing some more, and I walked in, this is when he said, this is James Daniel, he's a member of the gang in CME, he said, and the people in CME, no, no, and then he said, and I want you to go canvassing with him today. And so I stopped and I looked up, I said, now, Sherrod wants me to go canvassing in CME with a gang member that I've never met. And so I said, okay. Because it was Sherrod, and you trusted Sherrod not to do anything harmful. So then he said, you can't, see, if you go and see me without someone from there, say you, you know, anything could happen. Say so he'll keep this from happening, anything from happening to you. So then every day Sherrod would take us out there. Well, well actually, he didn't, he, he took away Felicia, because she was white. And, and that, therefore, the policeman would be more prone to, to follow the two of us than just me. So he sent Felicia somewhere else. And I went with Blue. He drew, Sherrod drove me out there and there was Blue. And, and, and in the office when he I said hello to Blue, he, he mumbled something, you know, he never looked at me. And uh, I, I noticed that he had on this white t-shirt and that he was sweating and there was sweat on his armpits. And, and I was just looking at and he, he was muscular, he was tall and very, very dark. So then I knew why they called him Blue. So when Sherrod took me out there, um, I got out of the car and Blue was standing there in this plaid shirt. And he still didn't look at me. And I said hi, and he said hi. And so we started off, and he never passed me. He walked behind me, and he would... 
like if, if that was a, a, a some obstruction on the side of a big piece of limb or something, he would run and get that out of the way and let me come up and then he would go back on the inside and he would just walk back there. And then we saw a group of, and see he was, he was a good distance behind me and we saw a group of fellows down at the, um, this can where they, I guess in winter they burn stuff. And anyway, they started yelling and saying stuff to him and so he said, wait a minute. So I stopped and he went down there and I couldn't hear what they were saying but I saw the other fellas doing the head like this. And then he came back, and I waited till he got back, and he said, okay. I mean, a few words, and so we kept walking. I would go in the house, he'd wait. I would come out and zigzag across the street, you know, because the houses were almost directly in front of each other. He would wait. And that happened all along that block. So when we got to the next block, there was another group of fellas. They had heard, but they didn't say a word. They just watched. And, and, and then Blue didn't know what to do with his hands because I have good peripheral vision and I would look and one while he had them in his thumbs and, and in his jeans like this and then he would have them rubbing here or even he would, it was like he was very, very nervous and I, and I was, I was kind of nervous too, you know. So we kept walking and we, we did that all the week until we, I had canvas and everything and then the only, like I said, I wrote this, I wrote about him recently but the only thing I thought about at that time because see the next day after we finished it was something else to do so you didn't have time to dwell on it but I did think this and I and I, I hope and I think he got it that last day when he walked me to the car and he opened the door for me and he would do that every day and I would say thank you, but I would just get in. But this particular day when he opened it, I looked him and he looked at me and we had eye contact and I said, thank you. And I think he knew what I meant because he gave up something to walk with me through CME in front of his gang members. Here I am, a 95 pound little college girl, you know. And here are all of his gang, and, and see, they would be there every day. They would be looking, and and that's when he would seem to be nervous, because he was the, the leader, and and I think he gave up, he gave up a part of his something. I don't know exactly what it is to do that for me. So that's what I was thanking him for, and um, I mean that things like that, they don't ever get told and you know I mean there's so many things that happened and they just never but he to me he was uh he was one of the few gang members who worked with the movement so he had to have some feeling of 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 what was right and what was wrong and all this even though he was macho and had scars and stuff. So that was an experience for me. And so while I was doing this, these are when the great pool jumps and see the stuff was happening all over Albany. Uh -huh. So it depended upon where you live mm -hmm. and where Sherrod told you to go. You know, what what happened depended on that. So I never met Randy Battle. But I read about the pool jump and all of that. But it was not a, a spontaneous thing as I understand. As I understand it was it was uh, planned. And, and there was some rumor, I don't know if it's true, that, that, that were, a pool was dyed. They, they tried to get, uh, I know they were trying to get some sort of dye from someone at the Marine base and they were going to dye the pool. I don't know if it ever happened, but that was rumored. But I wasn't in that area. That was out near the zoo and all out in that area. I never canvassed out there. I, I went out there for any So years. most of your work for SNCC was canvassing for the voting. Well, it was uh, office work, canvassing, and see, Bernice and I were a part of the Albany movement. We were on the program committee, and so every meeting that they had, we had to plan the music and sometimes the speakers. You know, get I don't mean the big people from out of town, but like uh, we had to to see who was going to lead the devotion, who was going to you know, as they say, line the hymns, and who would speak and things like that. And then we were singing too. And sometimes we would have to go for mass, there would be two mass meetings. One at Shiloh, one at, at, at Mount Zion. And one night there was one at Bernice's father's church over in East Auburn. And we had to go from Mount Zion over there to sing too. 
and the people singing were not the freedom singers. It would be Bernice and me, Bertha Goba, Andrew Reed, and Bluey Janey. Who, you know, whoever wanted to sing Ruth that. Ruth Harris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm see, proud. Ruth wasn't there at first. She mm -hmm. came later. Now, um, quickly, I'd like to find out this detail. In in '62, did you go to Spelman at first? When Dean Wright arranged up admission to different black colleges in mm -hmm. Georgia, mm -hmm. what made you come back? Well, I went. What do you mean, what made me come back? Did you stay there after you went in 62 momentarily, or did you wait and then go in 64? No, no, no. I went in 62. And this is what Bernie, this is what we did. Bernie's, these are the students who went to the AU Center. James Jones, uh, Andrew Williams, Bernie's, and William, Janie and I went. Janie and Bernie's and I went to Spelman. We went the whole semester, but we came back on weekends. We commuted. And, and th this is what we did. We wore black skirts and white blouses and we embroidered stuff on the blouses. It was freedom, justice, and equality. And then we would come home wearing this now, you know, it, it, and this bus, these buses went through all these small towns. But what the bus driver did, we tried to get to the front of the bus. He would take the tickets of the white people over our heads so we couldn't get there. And one time when Bernice went and I didn't go, she got up there, but it was raining and he opened his window so the rain would get on her. So we did things like that, and we would, we would, on the weekends we would go back, and then on the holidays we'd go back, and then in the summer we worked. And then when I needed, they didn't offer anything I needed, I worked the whole semester, a summer and a semester. And um, I worked with the Atlanta Student Movement too, and participated in the marches there, but I didn't go to jail there, because they blocked the emergency room at Grady, and if we had been arrested, that's what we would have been arrested for. And when I am arrested, I don't want to be breaking, you know, the legal law because you're not supposed to block emergency room, you know, the emergency exit. So Bernie said, "I chose not. We marched, but we chose not to be arrested." I noticed that that, in talking to some other people, that was a trend. You could choose to do the things to be arrested in Atlanta. Or you could choose to do the things that would make it where you could get away before being arrested. So, oh that's... well, I, I didn't know that, but all of the students from Spelman who went were arrested except Bernie's and, and me because they weren't thinking about the fact that they were breaking the law. I mean, we broke segregation laws, and we, like when we got on the bus, they arrested us. But those laws. You know, the buses were desegregated in the 40s, so it was just the South that, didn't re that refused to, to acquiesce. But to, to go into something and knowing that you were in the wrong, that was, to me, that's not the purpose. You know, that was a legitimate law. And I didn't want to be arrested for blocking the entrance. I wanted to be arrested for protesting that Grady wouldn't hire black people. <laughs> That, that's a, to me, that's a very tough question, especially in this day and age, because, and I don't want to take up your time. But Just say what you don't say. say. Why, why it's tough for me. If you look at what's happening now, and you said this generation, mm -hmm. if you look at what's happening now, the Republican Party is... Their goal is to take us back as far as they can. Boehner has said he's nostalgic for the 50s. So you know where we were in the 50s. That's Emmett Till. That's a, that's a lot of things. At this point now, all of the governors in these states are trying to pass laws to keep certain people from voting. If you look in Florida, people coming out of prison now have to wait five years before they can even ask to be restated so that they can vote. Well, if you serve your time and, and paid your debt to society, I think you should be able to vote as soon as you come out. That's one thing people need to work on, getting that changed. 
They're also doing other things to make it hard for poor people to vote, college students to vote, black people to vote. We, we fall in a lot of the, the, the categories because most of these people vote re Democratic. So college students, you know, have been able to vote. Now they're going to they're going to require, they're trying to get it so that, that certain uh, ID is, is required in order for you to vote. And it's going to make it very difficult for the elderly. It's going to make it difficult for a lot of poor black people and for college students. You, you, you know, they, and, and all of this is aimed at keeping the Democrats who, even though they're slow, are trying to be um, fair and, and, and work for the people. So it, it, it's even hard. It's, it's no longer a matter of marching. It's no longer, look what happened in Wisconsin. It's no matter of, of, of a thousand showing up. They're, it's, it's legal. They're, they're doing things the legal way. They're passing laws. They're going against women. They're passing laws so that here in Georgia, they want to fix it where if you have a miscarriage, you can be charged with um, murder. or you have, you have to prove that it wasn't abortion. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere, but I'm, I'm saying this is what... The mere what, idea of it. This is what you're dealing with now. Stuff like this is it, political. Uh, they're attacking now Planned Parenthood. Well, abortion is a small part of that. You got all of these millions of people over here. You got poor women who go there for pap smears and for all of the other kinds of things. So if they get rid of Planned Parenthood... That's gone. Well, see, they got rid of ACORN, all those lies that they told. Uh, and look at what they tried to do to Shirley Sherrod. So it, it's, to be honest with you, I don't know what I would tell them. I would tell them to probably go into the legal profession, <laughs> uh, make sure you register and vote, uh, because it, it, everything has changed. You know, you're in the lunch counter, you're on the desegregated bus, all of those things, but now it's taking a different turn. It's no longer about keeping you out of those things. It's about taking you all the way back. It's about destroying the middle class. It's about, even if you just say that, you know, you know where that leads us. If they're going to just, so it, it's, it's about survival and I don't have the answers to be honest with you. Maybe Bernice has some, you know. But what I do, I, there's one organization so far, I've signed 97 petitions. I can't get out in March. I would have been in Wisconsin if I could have. But I signed petitions. I work with groups and put my name with thousands of others and hope that that will make a difference. I contribute money when I can. But now it seems like it's going to be in the elections. You got the Tea Party. You have all of these people who have their own way of thinking about the Constitution, who want to change it, and who have gone against it. You have the Supreme Court who says corporations can spend as much money as they want. So it's all in the, in the government and in the legal system.